Okay, so it's a bit of a late one tonight, but um, current continuing with the like, series five of the death and impermanence from how to transform your life. Uh, the last video I labelled it as three of five, but it's not. It was two of five because <laughs> I'd done a meditation on death and impermanence before this uh, series of five. So the last video was the second of five, and this one is the third meditation out of five of death and impermanence from how to transform your life. Um, this third one is a bit different from the second one, because we're looking at three different uh, reasons now. So using using three ways of reasoning to gain conviction that the time of death is uncertain. So the first two meditations were using three ways of reasoning to gain conviction that, that death is certain. Now it's about gaining conviction that the time of death is uncertain. The first of these, one, the lifespan of living being, beings in this world is not fixed. Two, there are many more condi conditions conducive to death than to survival. And three, the human body is very fragile. <clears throat> Contemplating that the time of death is completely uncertain and understanding that there is no guarantee that I shall not die today, we should think deeply, day and night. I may die today. I may die today. Meditating on this feeling we shall come to a strong determination. Since I shall soon have to depart from this world, there is no sense in my, be my, in my becoming attached to the things of this life. Alright, so that was like the precinct before I do the... So just to give you some context before you try, you know, this meditation in, your, in one of your practices such as heart jewel. Right, so you can do heart jewel now, and then the halfway through, after the prayer of the stage of the path, you receive the blessings, and you can do this following Lama meditation. One, the lifespan of living beings in this world is not fixed. Sometimes we fool ourselves by thinking, I am young, and so I shall not die soon. But we can see how misguided this thought is merely by observing how many young people die before their parents. Right, so I'll read the first sentence and then you'll have to go to the book itself to to get the follow-on, so to get the content. Right, because uh, I think you really, you, you should be using the books anyway. Right, sometimes we think, I am healthy and so shall not die soon. Someone who is alive and well by the morning could be dead by the afternoon. Wow, that's a powerful thing to think about. Two, there are many more conditions conducive to death than to survival. Although our death is certain and our lifespan is indefinite, it would not be so bad if the conditions that lead to death were rare, but there are innumerable external and internal conditions that can bring about our death. The external environment causes deaths by famine, floods, fires, earthquakes, pollution and so on.
Even things we do not consider to be threatening, things that we think of as supporting and protecting our life, such as our house, our car, our best friend, can turn out to be causes of our death. People are sometimes crushed to death by their own house, or they fall to their death from their own staircase, and each day many people are killed in their cars. Some people are killed on holiday, and some are killed by their hobbies and entertainments, such as horse riders who are thrown to their death. And three, the human body is very fragile. Although there are many causes of death, as Nagarjuna said, there are many destroyers of our life force. Wow. About the water bubble. Or a scratch from a thorn. Contemplating that the time of death is completely uncertain and understanding that there is no guarantee that we shall not die today, we should think deeply, day and night, I may die today, I may die today. <coughs> Determination. Since I shall soon have to, de to depart from this world, there is no sense in my becoming attached to the things of this life. Instead, I shall take to heart the real essence of my human life by sincerely engaging in spiritual practice. And then there's a little uh, meditation on wisdom. If our body was possessed by an inherently existent I, then why do we have no control over our own death, when and how we die, what we experience thanks to our body, like we would if we wanted to discard our car or trade it in for a new one, for example. We do not choose any of these things, all arises from karma. If we have not done strong purification, or attained liberation, we shall suffer great pain, fear and confusion at our death time. This shows us that our body is not possessed by our eye. <coughs> so our body is not our eye. We already know that from doing our own meditation on emptiness of the eye. But our body is not even possessed by our eye. And the reality of sickness, aging and death show us that. Alright, so next I'll read through uh, the postscript to this meditation. What does engaging in spiritual practice mean? Essentially it means transforming the mind, overcoming delusions and negative actions and cultivating constructive thoughts and actions. <coughs> Excuse me. This is something we can be doing all the time, <coughs> not just while seated in meditation. An explanation of the different levels of training the mind will be given in part two. 
Whenever we put these teachings into practice, we are engaging in spiritual practice. The practice of training the mind is especially suited to this day and age when people experience so many difficulties. <coughs> That's what this uh, the entire meditation program emphasizes, is training the mind, lotong. Um, it's part of a lamrim structure of meditations, but it emphasizes mainly those meditations which help you train the mind, develop love and compassion, as we shall see, as uh, the uh, entire program and the entire book gets completed in the, on this channel. There's another meditation on it, on wisdom, guarding our body. Again, I've written these myself, edited, edited them over and over again until they were perfect. If our body is the basis upon which an inherent existent I depends, then why do we have different experiences throughout our life? If our body is the basis upon which an inherent existent I depends, then why do we have different experiences throughout our life? How can can we fall asleep and take on a dream body if our I depends upon our body? This is like the opposite way around of the previous wisdom meditation. In this example, uh, our eyes dependent upon our body. Whereas the previous idea was that our body was dependent upon our eye. So we'll look at things from both one one way around and on another occasion the other way around. They're both extremes or misconceptions around our body and I. How can our I take rebirth if it depends upon this body, which we forsake at the time of death? Is our sickness caused by our karma or simply by this body? If the latter then how do we explain purification and cure of our disease? If our body is the basis for our eye, then how can we explain how a hungry ghost sees a glass of pus and blood, a god sees a glass of nectar, and a human being sees a glass of water? If our body is the basis upon which our eye depends, then how does our body cause us to experience anger, attachment, jealousy, love, compassion, and so forth? Is our eye physical or mental? So the example of the hungry ghost or compared to the God, compared to the human tasting of glass of liquid. Um, that's in Joyful Path of Good Fortune. It's also in Ocean of Nectar. This is very interesting. Uh, part of Ocean of Nectar. This shows us that our eye does not depend upon our body as its basis. Therefore, our eye is merely imagined and arises from karma, whether that karma is pure or impure. Over and out. <laughs>